Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dee Miles. Welcome to our Mental Health for Activists workshop tonight. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing uh, reactivity versus uh, developing healthy uh, responses to challenges. But before I turn the mic over to our presenters tonight, I'd like to alert you to some upcoming activities. So please mark your calendar for on September 16th, Monday, September 16th at seven o'clock PM Eastern. We will have another uh, mental health for activists uh, workshop. And that evening we will be discussing uh, egocentrism versus collectivity uh, navigating the ego. So we hope you will mark your calendar and plan to join us that evening uh, as well. Uh, in addition, we'd like to invite you to join us for a group uh, read. We will do a book talk in the future. And the book we have selected to collectively uh, read is Alienation. The title is Alienation, Marx's Conception of Man in Capitalist Society, written by Bertel Ullman, B-E-R-T-E-L-L, Ullman, O-L-L-M-A-N. So we, we invite you to grab a used copy of the book from your best used bookstore um, and uh, join us in a group read, and we will have uh, a a uh, book talk uh, some at some point uh, in the future. Okay, so without uh, further delay, I will turn the mic over to our first panelist tonight, Diana. You Hi, have the phone. Um, so I'm gonna be kind of talking about increasing regulation so that when you are in a stressful situation, you will be able to take a step back before reacting. Um, a lot of this is practice that you do outside of the stressful situations. And I will kind of go over the way different strategies and things that maybe will help you kind of be able to not react. So the way that you decrease unhealthy reactions, you know, and this could be in a lot of settings, right? Like at work or when you are talking to other people or, you know, um, you get somebody that says something, right? Your heart rate goes up and all of a sudden you're not really able to like assess the situation. You are just reacting. And a lot of times that makes things a lot more stressful, a lot worse. And you wanna be able to take a step back before you get to that boiling point. So, the first piece of this is becoming aware of your emotions and not just like, oh, I'm already really angry. I'm already really stressed. I'm already really anxious when it's really, really high. But being aware of that first layer of tingle, of hint of what you're feeling before it comes to a place where you can't stop it. You know, kind of like if you've ever been driving and you see people that are like honking and cursing and screaming. You know, like you don't want to get to that point. So that is what the awareness of emotions piece is. The second part is this distress tolerance. And it is kind of what it sounds like. It is the ability to manage really difficult, uncomfortable, um, painful emotions and being able to not make things worse and to be able to not necessarily not feel them, but to kind of get through them. So the first piece of this is pay, being able to pay attention to your physical sensations and using those to identify what you're feeling. And so I'm gonna talk about kind of two different ways that you can start to practice this in your day-to-day -day life. It doesn't need to be anything that, you know, you spend hours on and it's super stressful. It's not at all kind of what this is supposed to be. So the first one is check-ins and basically it is you Taking the time, it could be as short as 10 seconds, checking in to notice any sensations in your body that you feel. There can't be any judgment or evaluation, meaning like, oh, I feel so bad, or I shouldn't be feeling this, or I shouldn't be th feeling that. You are just noticing the sensations. And so two kind of different ways that you can try this is if you're somebody that likes to drink coffee or tea or anything hot, or actually cold, it 
you know, doesn't matter. Um, as you're holding the cup in your hand, kind of notice what you're feeling. Notice the sensation. How does it feel in your skin? Uh, how does your arm feel? Do you feel anything else? Put the cup down. What are the changes in, in your palm? Is there, you know, is your palm cooler? Is it hotter? Is it warmer? And then you repeat. And do that for two cycles, three cycles, you know, depending on kind of how you're feeling. The other way to notice it, notice any like physical changes and sensations are if you're doing any kind of movement, right? So like whether you're working out, stretching, you know, any anything like that, cardio, weightlifting, even if you are just walking, you can start to pay attention to changes in your temperature, in your breathing, um, any other kind of sensations in your muscles, in your joints, anything that is changing, notice that. You can stop, notice the changes after you stop, and then repeat. The other way is a little bit more targeted, and that's something called a body scan. And essentially, you scan your body from, from bottom up, from your feet to your head, notice any physical sensations and you kind of name them. And again, no judgment, no kind of self-evaluation. If thoughts happen while you're doing this, you're not trying to be like, oh, I shouldn't be having these thoughts. You are just noticing. It's kind of important though, this is the, the bigger piece, is to use words that are specific and descriptive and, and this is what I mean. So like, if you're feeling pain, that's not super specific. What kind of pain is it? Is it throbbing? Is it aching? Is it pulsating? Is it sharp? Is, is, is it dull? And so using those words. The other one is sort of judgmental words. And I said bad, but it could be like a good word or the word good or something like that. And try to be more neutral but this is still descriptive so you can say you feel empty you feel numb you feel tired anything that you're noticing and i gave you an example of a bunch of different like words that you can use to describe sensations um so there's damp dense dull electric energized um tense jittery wobbly if you want to like look up a list of words like that, it is um, physical sensation vocabulary. There's a lot out there, but you can also um, I guess screenshot this piece of it. Um, and then I gave you kind of a very specific way um, to also go through a body scan. So if you want to, you can try this right now as I kind of walk you through it. And, and kind of experience it. So I want everybody to take a few deep breaths, um, make your exhales a little bit longer than your inhales. Close your eyes. Become aware of your five senses. What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What do you feel? And then very slowly, starting with your toes and scanning up towards your head. Notice what sensations you're experiencing. Are, is there tension in your toes? Is there any tension in your legs? Is your jaw clenched? Are your muscles tight anywhere? Are there any knots in, in your stomach? What do you notice? And as you continue to scan, just pay attention to that. And once you're done with that, you can stretch, you can move, you can shake, you can breathe into those areas with tension, and then notice how you feel once you've breathed in that tension, once you've released some of that tension. So the next piece of it, once you're more aware of what the sensations in your body are, what you're physically feeling, you can start to use those feelings to help you identify what the emotion is. And what a lot of 
researchers found is that generally people might have a hard time thinking about what they're feeling, but if they are paying attention to their, their body as they learn how it responds, it is fairly consistent, so you will be able to better identify what it is that's going on. So what the way I like to look at this when it comes to emotions, what am I feeling? Mad, sad, scared, you know? And then go to, okay, let's say I'm feeling mad, right? Like, you know, I just had a really bad day. Just, I'm just mad. Can I deal with this emotion right now? Like, can I deal with this feeling right this second? Okay, yes, I have the time and I have the focus. Okay, so I'm going to pay attention and not judge myself and think about what this feeling might be trying to tell me. What is it that I need? How is it trying to help me? What is the information that me being mad? Maybe it's that, I don't know, I'm hungry. Maybe it's that. I'm stressed. Maybe it's that, you know what, actually, this person hurt my feelings. Or I feel that, you know, somebody disrespected me. Okay, what do I actually need to do? What do I need? Do I need to talk to a friend? Do I need to go eat a snack? Do I need to lay down? Am I just exhausted and I need to disconnect and relax? And If the answer is yes, I can deal with this feeling right now, you should have about 15 minutes or so to kind of step back and deal with what you're feeling. If the answer is no, right? Like you're in a meeting, you are talking to someone face-to-face and you can't walk away from that situation. Like take a second, acknowledge that there's a reason why you're having that emotion right now, that feeling. It's trying to tell you something. You will come back to it later. So the the key here is sort of not to try and argue with the fact that you're having an emotion, but to acknowledge that you are having it. You just can't necessarily deal with it right this second. It has to be put away and you will come back to it at a certain time, tonight, in an hour, in two hours, whatever it is. If you have a hard time kind of having the vocabulary of like what your feelings are. I gave kind of four big examples, which is anger, fear, sadness, and happiness, different varieties. You can also start paying attention to kind of the level of of the feeling. Like, is it little, is it big? You know, like a, almost like a thermometer. Some other ways that you can practice identifying and recognizing emotion, because it does take practice is something like listening to music and pairing songs to certain feelings, certain emotions, or looking at what sensations and emotions music creates in you. You know, there are some songs that make me really happy, some make me really sad, some bring on nostalgia. So things like that, paying attention to those things. And you can kind of do the same thing with images, you know, photographs, pictures, artwork, Images is not is broad. It could be anything, anything that you can kind of look at. And of course, the third one is like journaling. And that is like writing about your experiences, allowing yourself to to have that space where you are writing about what's going on. And it is a place where you're not being judged, even by yourself. The second piece of it is distress tolerance. And like I said before, it's the ability to navigate uncomfortable, stressful, frustrating events and emotions and urgence without making it worse. Um, Being able to understand that like, no, I like, I'm not in a good place. And like, if I do something now, it's not gonna go well. Like I need a second, right? And the first one is tip, it's temperature meaning take something cold or, you know, and and put it on your your eyes, your cheeks, your wrists. You can splash some cold water on your face. You can actually put it on the back of your neck if you want. You can like literally like take something cold and place it over your eyes because that also will feel really good. Intense exercise, getting your heart rate up. 
and paced breathing, which is the exhale is longer than the inhale and also paired muscle relaxation. So you are kind of like what we did with the body scan, but instead of paying attention to the sensations, you're focusing on muscle groups and you're contracting, tightening them, holding it for five seconds and then releasing. Here's the thing, the, the paced breathing, making your exhales longer than the inhales is really, really good for a lot of situations because it helps your body kind of reset and calm down. And if you are feeling panicked, really anxious, stressed, that will also help you not go into a much more stress state, you know? You can also focus on sensations. So for example, um, you can use pressure points or create pressure. Um, there's one right here that, that you can kind of massage as you kind of breathe. And that is really good, especially like if it's, you know, a situation where you have to be a little bit low key, you can't necessarily like step away or maybe you can't just, you know, like close your eyes and start breathing. You know, something like a pressure point might help. Um, having something that is like like a really strong med or maybe like sour candy can also help you kind of step away mentally from whatever it is that you're experiencing it kind of helps you like break that or if it is something like a longer time setting maybe focusing on something that's like a small object in your hand and paying attention to either like the way that it feels or the way that it looks, you know, or the way that you can like fidget with it almost. Um, any kind of also scents, um, you know, perfumes or air freshener, or anything that is enjoyable for you is also something that you can use. So think five senses and focusing on that. And the last thing that i will talk about is something called stop which is you stop you pause you don't react and that's the ability to be like oh okay like no thank you not right right now like i need a second being it practicing taking a step back walking away taking a few deep breaths maybe using some of the other things i talked about paying attention to your surroundings to how you're feeling what are you noticing what are you observing and then proceeding mindfully um and figuring out what you can do and proceeding mindfully really just means like um not disconnecting and paying attention to what you're doing instead of reacting and again like i i, I realize that this is easier said than done but you can get to here through the other pieces that i kind of talked about um and making those things part of something that you do consistently um, will help. And the key here isn't necessarily that you have to do this all the time, perfectly 100% of the time, right? But having it be a consistent part of routines and practices that you set up that you can always come back to. So that is the bigger and more important piece. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Diana. We'll now go to our next panelist. Richard, you have the mic. Thank you, Diana. My name's Richard. I'll be taking us through a few different healthy response skills. So the idea here is um, I'll be going over three kind of, two of them are acronyms to re recall, and then one of them is just kind of a category of thing to examine, and then after we go through that, we'll go through a um, example so that we can see how you might apply these in a situation. And the idea behind this is to improve our um, responses to other people, like maybe a heated argument in a, a union meeting, which is the example we'll get to later. All right, so the first skill to talk about is HALT. So HALT comes from addiction medicine. Basically, it's just 
four things to quickly check in anytime you're feeling activated. The idea behind this is if you are feeling, again, because this comes from addictions, if you're maybe feeling the urge to go use, you can kind of do a check-in to see if these things are clouding your judgment. So the first one is hungry. Are you hungry? Uh, are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? So four kind of really simple things that can have a profound impact on the way that we think about a situation. We're much more likely to react on impulse or in a way that we might not rationally want to act were it not for those four experiences. The next thing I, I want to talk about are cognitive distortions. So cognitive distortions are a category of like types of thought patterns that we have. And this comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, cognitive distortions are not something that only happens to people who are you know, experiencing a mental health disorder. They're things that everybody have um, because our, our brains are just wired for shortcuts. It's how we're able to do things without really thinking it through, thinking about driving a car, you're not thinking about every single step that you're going along the way. But sometimes these shortcuts are not helpful. And the, there's a whole bunch of different types of cognitive distortions. The four that I want to talk about today are four that really impact our perceptions of interpersonal conflict. The first one is mind reading. So that's assuming the thoughts or motivation of, of others. You might be having a conversation with somebody and they say something and your immediate thought is he thinks I'm stupid. You might not have any reason to believe that based off of the actual conversation that was taking place, but that's just a thought that comes into your mind and then you begin to accept that it's true. You also might kind of anticipate the person, oh, they're, they're trying to get me to do something and maybe they're just being pleasant. So mind reading is a big one. The next one is labeling. That's making a generalization about another person. So this could be good or bad. They never make a mistake or they're always dropping the ball. And again, it might be an accurate characterization, but then it becomes a larger thing. So if somebody rarely makes a mistake, that doesn't mean that they're never going to make a mistake. So if somebody tells you they're going to do something and they forget to do it, that doesn't mean that you can necessarily assume that you forgot to tell them to do it. There's always a possibility that somebody didn't do something. Um, personalization or blaming. Um, so that's making yourself the unique motivator of a situation. So the examples here are they seemed grumpy, so I must have done something wrong. They have it out for me. Um, on the flip side, you can also make it, again, you know, kind of boosting yourself. And then overgeneralization, um, this again is kind of taking a generalization, which could be generally true, but then applying it broadly, much more so than would be logically uh, appropriate. So with cognitive distortions and thinking about the purpose of this presentation. If you notice that you have something that sounds like a cognitive distortion and you have the time for it, um, you don't always have the time for it, but you can step back and think, is this logical? What evidence was there in this interaction to support my logic? Are there other alternatives that would equally explain the situation? And then do I still believe that that was a true characterization? And we'll, we'll, this might make more sense with the example when we get there. The last thing I want to talk about is DEAR MAN. Um, so this is another acronym. And this is uh, from Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. Um, and basically the idea is that you want to be assertive when you're addressing a situation because if you're passive, you're probably not going to make any changes that would be important to you. And if you're aggressive, you're likely to escalate the situation. And there's a middle road. And it, it, it's something that some people are just naturally assertive. Some people 
have a hard time with kind of being forward with somebody while also not being aggressive or passive. And this is a good, simple formulation for how to approach a situation. So it can, we'll go through the acronym. D is for describe. You're describing the situation in as objective a manner as you can. So we're not talking about, hey, you left the dishes on the table and then it's like the worst thing in the world. You're just saying you left the dishes on the table. E, you're expressing how you feel about that um, or your opinions about it. So that would be, you left the dishes on the table, that aggravated me. A, assert what you're hoping to address. I would like you to pick up the dishes in the future. R, reinforce why that has a positive impact on the situation for either you, the other person, or for, you know, if, if this is a relationship that has meaning, why it would matter to the relationship. When you pick up the dishes, uh, the apartment's cleaner. The MAN is going to be the parts about like how to approach the conversation because you, you make the statement, you left the dishes on the table, that aggravated me, I would like you to pick up the dishes so we can have a better situation in the apartment. The M is to be mindful of the discussion and not veer off topic because if you bring up every time that your roommate left their dirty laundry by the door, that doesn't have to do with the dishes. And when you kind of start bringing things in, you're going to make a person defensive or you'll escalate the situation beyond what you're trying to accomplish. A is a pure confident. So you're not trying to be overbearing of the situation, but you're also not trying to cow away from it. And then N is being willing to negotiate your position uh, because you know it, it takes two to tango and maybe there are situations where the dishes need to be left on the table sometimes because you're running late. Anyway, uh, this, this is the example I came up with. And we'll go through this, and then we'll go through those three different skills and concepts to kind of pick apart what's going on here, and then we'll use that last one for how we might address the situation. So this is a union meeting. You have a coworker who rarely attends union meetings and always seems to side with management when they do. They came to a discussion after work leading up to bargaining um, and keep putting down other people's ideas, saying that they aren't being realistic or that they don't understand the financials. Uh, you've been working with the bargaining committee for weeks on some of these uh, items and you're getting really angry. You're wondering, do they think that you're dumb? They haven't done anything since the last contract and now they're taking shots at your work. Why do they have it out for you? Um, that ingrate doesn't deserve to be a member. So you're feeling like you wanna tell them that they aren't welcome at future meetings. So it, as you can see, we've, we've got a situation where a person is being disrespectful in the meeting. We don't know their intentions, right? But the impact that they're having right now is negative. Your initial inclination right now is to kind of escalate the situation, maybe have, have it out with them. But let's kind of go through these and see what's going on. So the first part is halt, right? You remember that you wanted to take a second to check in with yourself and see if you're acting in a helpful way or if there are things that are clouding your judgment. So this is after work and you've been working on this outside of work for a few weeks. So are you hungry? Did you remember to have a snack before the meeting? Maybe, maybe not. Um, are you angry? Yes, you're angry. They're making you mad. Are you feeling lonely? No, not, not right now. You're, you're in a group with your comrades. Are you feeling tired? Yeah, probably. So you've gone through this and you're like, okay, there might be a couple of things that I need to check before I go forward. And this would maybe be a good time to review some of um, the topics that Diana went over. Then we get into cognitive distortions. So going through that scenario, there, there are a few cognitive distortions that I put in there. Do they think you're dumb? You don't know what they're thinking. And it's important, especially when you're feeling like you need to approach somebody, 
to know that you can't really know what the other person's intentions were. It doesn't matter if you think that they were intentionally being rude to you or that they're trying to talk down to you. That part is kind of immaterial if you're trying to have a productive conversation. You need to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Labeling. So that ingrate doesn't deserve to be a member, right? We've, we've labeled that person as an ingrate. We're kind of putting them in an out group and we don't want to deal with them. We need to check that impulse and remember that they're a union member regardless of whether or not I like them or if they've been productive in this meeting. Uh, personalization and blaming. So why do they have it out for me? In the scenario I gave, you weren't the person presenting the topics necessarily. So they wouldn't necessarily know that you've been working on those things. So even though they were saying nasty things, that doesn't necessarily mean that they had it out for you. And that's something to also kind of check. When we're doing things in the background, we don't, it can be really easy to involve ourselves personally with the, the product because that's our labor. But that's not always perceived on the outside. And then overgeneralizing. They haven't done anything since the last contract. That may or may not be true. Um, but that's kind of outside the scope of the um, case example. But it's something to, to check yourself. Is that a true thing or am I jumping to conclusions, making this person out to be a bigger enemy in my mind than they need to be? So we've gone through, we, we've stopped ourselves. We thought about some of the things that might be impacting how we're feeling in the moment. Then we thought about maybe some of the thoughts that we're having about the person are exaggerated or aren't going to be super helpful. So then how do we approach it? Uh, because we, we can't just let that go, right? So we're going to go through the dear man. The MAN we're not going through because we don't have an interaction to, to be mindful of and appear confident in. But we're going to use the DEAR to formulate our, conver our initiating conversation. So throughout this meeting, you've made remarks about the realism of our proposals and indicated that we're working with bad numbers. Express how we're feeling about it. I feel your comments are dismissive of the work that we have put in and have not been helpful. Assert what you would like. I would appreciate it if you could provide some clarity on your remarks and think about how your words might be perceived by others. And then reinforce. We want your feedback if you're willing to help. We're stronger when we're united. And so thinking about the context here, right? We want to maintain our membership. We want people to be on board with what we're doing. So we need to give this person an opportunity to come back to the table and be a productive participant, right? If we are working off the assumption that, hey, maybe they're not thinking about what they're saying. Maybe they're feeling like they did a bunch of stuff last time, they wanted to sit it out, and they have things and aren't being tapped, right? We need to give them opportunities to have a productive conversation. But at the same time, we need to be firm with you know, the things that you've said have not been helpful and it feels bad to, to hear them. Um, and basically, like the, the idea here is just to create a, the framework for a conversation where you can address the poor behavior while also giving that person an opportunity to come back. Because a lot of times people aren't thinking about what they're saying and how that might be received by people. They tend to be caught up in their own world, right? And that's a hard thing to, to deal with when they come back into a room and they're, they're working in a collective. Um, but thinking about all of it in some, we are trying to think through, are there things that are impacting me outside of the situation, right? So we're going to go through our quick checklist of the different things that might be impacting how we're experiencing it. Am I accurately interpreting the situation? Going through maybe some of those cognitive distortions, the ones that you're able to remember, or there, there are plenty of others. There's whole books on this if you'd like to go through it. Um, and then how can I address the situation without escalating it? So that we can address the situation, have something productive, and maybe resolve it 
well. These things aren't going to work if the person is there just to agitate or is like not committed at all to the group. And that's something that you'll always have to eventually deal with because a relationship and like having healthy relationship skills only works when both parties are interested in maintaining that relationship. So that, that's just a caveat for all of that. Uh, but with that, that concludes my part of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Diana and Richard. We will now open the floor for discussion. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to Molly. Molly, you are unmuted, so uh, please unmute your mic on your end. Uh, thank you. Super helpful. Um, I'm just thinking about how anger and angry responses has a cultural component. Um, that there's a lot of kind of support in um, some communities and some cultures and some families to like respond with anger and that it can be like a thing that's funny to do um, and encouraged and um, that there's like a like well, how how mean can you be um, kind of egging each other on and I'm just I'm just thinking about kind of like the the shifting from this culture process and the the opportunity there but also kind of a, a loss there um so that's just some thoughts and thank you again thank you molly next we will go to cindy thank you i just want to take my place in the room today and yesterday have been a huge huge example of this i'm afraid the club is going down this has happened one time before and now i feel like our group is again coming late to the um anti-electoralism party and going into it full scale and ignoring the um you know I, i'm not i don't argue so i'm not arguing but when i add something that um has to do with electoralism the conversation goes off in wild directions. And I know that part of it is that I feel as if I've done so much work. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, let's uh, take one more question and then maybe go back to the panelists and then we'll take another round of, of questions after that as well. Um, so let's go to Carlos. Hi, good afternoon, guys. I just want to say I thought that was a very good presentation on your guys' part, on a bit more of an advanced mental health workshop. You know, I think we all know clench your butt, think you're, imagine you're at the beach. But, uh, you know, I really like those little acronyms, tips, you know, and uh, gosh, I already forgot the other one. But, you know, I think it's really helpful, especially with what's going on in the country right now, for us to manage our emotions and be sensible you know uh it's very easy to get angry especially around family and people we trust but especially i personally you know uh, i use a lot of those similar uh, coping mechanisms on the daily uh i think it's very helpful uh to have these workshops and i really appreciate your all's time thank you guys thank you carlos and um now let's turn it over to our panelists so back to diana and richard um, so just thinking about the first comment about the cultural piece of anger, I think that that actually might be something really important to keep in mind. Also, when you, you are just dealing with people that you don't really know whether their intentions are genuine or not, keeping in mind that it may come across differently, but also that egging each other on and seeing how people respond and, and depending on, you know, kind of what, what situation you're in, obviously. But that could be super useful. So you don't always need to lose that piece of it. It may be a good kind of view of making sure that everybody's on the same page. Does that make sense? And I think that what I've seen from a lot of people that I work with is a lot of anger. And I think that anger is often justified. And I do think that like it's not necessarily a negative thing unless 
it gets to a point where you are rupturing your relationships and to a point where it, they can't be repaired. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Richard? Uh, yeah, and I, I, I think also just kind of thinking about the play fighting and fighting in jest, it's um, uh, oftentimes just because there, there's an assumption that the world is going to be a bad and terrible place. So fostering resilience in that way um, is, all, is it's a natural response, but it's not necessarily one that's going to be fruitful if you don't know how to turn it off. Um, and then going to the, the acronyms, if you want to write them down, um, there was STOP, S-T-O-P, TIP, T-I-P-P, HALT, H-A-L-T, and Dear Man, D-E-A-R-M-A-N. And if you Google those things, there's worksheets that will also be able to kind of walk you through that. So if there are things that sounded interesting today and maybe it didn't kind of um, click over our presentations, there's plenty of resources for free out there that you'd be able to access with a quick Google. Eric, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, I, uh, so I'm angry. The other person is angry. I know I'm angry. I know the other person is angry. Should I try to pursue a conversation or not? Okay, thank you, Dee. So we'll we'll go back once again then to the floor and then back to our panelists um, for uh, to, to for responses and also for a summary. Uh, let's go to Stefan. Okay, this question is for Richard, um, specifically about DBT, since you mentioned it. Um, my partner has BPD, and, and we've looked at some DPT uh, exercises, and she found them really helpful, but we we haven't been able to find, I, I've heard there are like groups, and there are practitioners, we haven't been able to find anything um, for her. Uh, we're in Los Angeles. I was just wondering if there are any like resources or portals or anything to help people who are looking for a, DP, a DBT, either therapist or group or anything like that. Thank you, Stephen. So next, let's go to uh, Brandon. Um, yeah, I guess, so my question was, if so, I, I think a lot of these work really well in circumstances where you can communicate clearly. But I'm thinking of the context of like being at a protest, there's like a lot going on, people shouting over each other, like there's a lot of stimulation. And I'm wondering how you can kind of, I guess, like apply like Dear Man or apply tip in these like very, like sometimes chaotic circumstances. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, let's go to Gilda. Oh, this is Gilda. And um, I muted my, I, I took my hand down because I just wanted um, uh, to hear again uh, the acronyms, but I have them all now. Help, help Stop, Tip, and Dear Man. Um, it would be wonderful at the beginning of some of our meetings with our comrades if <laughs> someone could do like a three minute review of some of these uh, acronyms just to get the meeting, you know, moving forward. So anyway, good work, you two. Thanks. Thank you, Gilda. So with that, I think we'll return it to our panelists for um, responses and, and also a summary. So um, why don't we start with Diana? Hi, so I'm gonna start with you are angry. So do you pursue a conversation? That sort of depends. Who are you, who is the person? What is your relationship with them? Um, is this somebody that you value that relationship, that conversation? Is that somebody in your club? Somebody that is, you have had experiences having conversations with before? And so, yeah, then maybe. It is also possible that this is your cousin who keeps saying things that are very triggering on purpose. And so then probably not, you know, maybe because that is your experience with them and having conversation with them 
isn't going to lead anywhere because you've tried before. And so it is knowing your own limits too. So there are times when I've been angry where I needed to just say, you know what, I, this is, this is not for me. I can't, this is not a place where I can make things better. I will make it worse and step away. And there are times where I can be angry and have it be productive. Um, but that is sort of the way I look at it. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Richard? Yeah, so I, I would echo Diana's statement on that. I, I think that knowing the specifics of that circumstance are important. If there's somebody who you can set the framework, hey, we both know we're pissed, we need to stay focused on the topic, we're going to avoid name calling, you're able to operate professionally, um, or <laughs> that maybe professional isn't the right word, but you know, cordially, that would be an okay situation, but there are plenty of times when maybe that's a cue to, to sleep on it. In terms of finding a DBT therapist, the search words you might use, I'm not familiar with LA, uh, but the search word you might use is full fidelity DBT. Um, so that would be a, a clinic that offers typically groups, uh, a 24-hour on-call person, and then your DBT therapist. Oftentimes they're connected with an IOP or a um, PHP program. Um, but it also, if you search for the Linehan Institute, they, they're the only people who can provide certified training. Um, so then they, I believe, have some sort of way of keeping track and so you can find out who's gone through that. Uh, and then to, to Brendan's question about maintaining composure in a protest, I, I trying to be like razor focused on that M, that mindful, is maybe the the best you can hope for. Just being mindful of your objectives because you know if somebody throws a water bottle or a beer can or something at you. You know, there, there's going to be a lot of wants for a response, and that's the purpose of their action. But you have to remember what the purpose of your action is. And it, that gets really tricky, um, which is why it's really important to, to maybe practice some of those awareness skills that Diana was talking about to be able to hold yourself in the moment, what your objective is, why you're there. Are you supporting the message of the action? Are you going to be detracting from it? Of course, you know, it, it is the detraction an opportunity. That's all sorts of things that you, you need to be cognizant of and being rash isn't going to be helpful. Okay, um, Diana, and uh, thank you, Eric, for your uh, um, uh, facilitating the question and uh, comment. Period. So, Diana and Richard, do you have any closing remarks? I would say the biggest takeaway that that I want people to have is to know yourself, like know your limits, be aware of where your boundaries are. And I know that word gets thrown out a lot these days, but can you have this conversation? You may not be able to. There are certain people, certain topics, certain times that you will not be able to work through things and you may not be the person for that situation in like a group conflict and that is okay but you do have to know yourself well enough to know when that may mean you need to take a break. Richard, thank you Diana. Really well said, I don't have anything to add. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this uh, was our third workshop, I guess. Uh, and so, again, September 16th, we will have uh, the fourth workshop on mm, egocentrism versus collectivity, navigating the ego. And we also invite you to join us in a, in a group read of Alienation by Bertal Ullman. So thank you for attending tonight. Um, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Richard. And we look forward to your helping us navigate this craziness. 
uh, going forward. And I invite everybody to watch the movie, Wag the Dog, Wag the Dog. Watch that movie, watch that movie. It'll uplift your spirits. Run it three or four times like I did yesterday. It will uplift your spirits dealing with this craziness. So thank you and good night.